Hello, everyone. Congratulations. We have made it to the last lecture. Happy June 8th. All right. Today, we're going to be capping off the biology content with human anatomy part two. All right. And so I will be touching upon these systems I did not touch upon last week. Um, some more in depth and some very briefly, just a one sentence function. Um, but let's get into it. All right. And so let me share my screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Let me pull this down. Awesome. All right. And so we are going to be picking up with the digestive system. All right. And so what the digestive system essentially is uh, responsible for is for taking the food that we consume and breaking it down into usable size pieces. All right. And so it all starts in the mouth. All right. In the mouth, we chew with our uh, teeth, and that is called mechanical digestion, all right? This is just breaking apart um, a big piece of steak or a mouthful of spicy chicken or whatever you have consumed and just breaking that down into smaller pieces, all right? Please chew your food before you choke because it is a choking hazard, right? Um, and so we have the esophagus, all right? It's different than the trachea, all right? The esophagus is meant for food, all right? And this connects the mouth to the stomach. All right. Um, there is some stuff up here like your epiglottis and stuff, pharynx and larynx and such. We're not going to go through that right now. All right. But the esophagus is the main highway from the mouth to the stomach. All right. Once it's in the stomach, all right, we all know there's stomach acid in there. And that stomach acid will take that um, mechanically broken down food. All right. And uh, it'll start to chemically digest. Right. So just to recap. Mechanical digestion happens in the mouth and chemical digestion occurs in the stomach, all right? And so once it's in the stomach, it uh, takes on the term chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, all right? Um, this is just a mixture of food and uh, stomach acid, all right? And so um, we have these parts of our stomachs and parts of our digestive system um, they're called sphincters, right? We have them all over our body and they essentially maintain that there is only a one-way system in our digestive system, all right? Things enter our mouth and they exit down lower, all right? And that is maintained by these things called sphincters, all right? And so you have a pyloric sphincter in your uh, stomach, all right? And once that opens, that um, acid chyme and food mixture, all right, will start entering the small intestine, all right? The small intestine, uh, the food hits that before the large intestine, all right? People think it's large than small. It's not. It is small intestines than large intestines. All right. And so once in the small, uh, once the food is in the small intestine, this is actually where most of the absorption of material occurs. And so once the food or chyme is in that small intestine, it is very, very small and it's in solution. All right. It's, it's, it's like a juice. All right. And so we have these special cells that line the inner tube of our small intestine that essentially acts as a large amount of surface area for reactions to occur. And what type of reactions occur? A lot of diffusion of things like amino acids, lipids, nucleotides and such, all right? Um, a lot of the things that we consume, we don't even realize what we take out of them. But um, every single time we eat vegetables or plant matter and such, all right, there's a lot of nitrogen in there. And that's one of the only ways that we can get nitrogen that's usable in our body. We breathe it in um, every single time we respire, but we don't have a system to take in that nitrogen, all right? And so um, once a lot of the food um, has been um, broken down and absorbed in the small intestines, all right, and we've gotten all the things like those amino acids, vitamins, and everything that we can possibly get out of it, um, the, uh, the small intestine will uh, again, use a sphincter and uh, open up into the large intestine. And the large intestine, this is essentially where all of that juice becomes a little bit more dry. And so the um, 
the large intestine's job is to absorb water, all right? So we try to retain as much water as we uh, can when we ingest it, all right? We don't wanna become dehydrated, and so we do our best to absorb what we can out of the apples that we eat, for instance, all right? We, we take all the water out of that, and we take the sugar, and then all of those other fibers and stuff, that ends up going out, all right? And um, speaking of going out, all right, so um, the small intestine, it's going to absorb all of those vitamins, amino acids, and all those like big uh, macromolecules that we need for life, all right? And once that food goes out of the small intestine into the large intestine, um, it will start becoming um, a very dried piece of matter, and eventually it becomes poop, right? <laughs> and then... Um, that's the end of the story. <laughs> Once you are exiting the large intestine, you are exiting the body, all right? And so, um, once again, mechanical digestion in the mouth, chemical digestion in the uh, stomach, and um, through what we actually call peristaltic movements, all right? Um, those sphincters maintain that um, one direction system, all right? And um, peristalsis is essentially a, a non-controllable muscular movement, making sure things move in the correct direction, all right? Um, okay, so that's enough on a digestive system. And so now I want to go to the respiratory system. Ooh, gotta go up. Sorry, guys. Reproductive lymphatic. Oh, there it is. All right. Um, all right. So the respiratory system. All right. Another big system. One of the ones I'm going to spend a little bit more time on. All right. And so, as you're watching this video, hopefully you're breathing and you are using your respiratory system. All right. Um, we know of the two entrances into our respiratory system, and those are called the um, the nostrils. All right. Our nose and our mouth. All right. Um, both of those entrances, nose and mouth, connect in the same area. <laughs> and um, that's in the back of the throat. And so you see this um, label here where my cursor is, it says pharynx, all right? So notice how this red tissue from the nasal cavities go through the back of the throat and meet up essentially where um, the mouth meets the back of the throat, all right? Um, this is why you can <laughs> unfortunately uh, laugh with food in your mouth and um, or um, some milk in your mouth and milk will come out of your nose, right? These are a connection here, right? And so you intake air through the nose or mouth and it goes down and now we are in the trachea. The trachea is only meant for air exchange, right? And you'll notice how it's kind of um, colored, right? And so if you actually delicately rub your throat a little bit, you should feel that there are some rings, right? Um, there's actually a bit of cartilage covering your trachea to keep it a um, protected tube, right? Um, what you would be touching, all right, gentlemen, we have an Adam's apple. That Adam's apple forms on the trachea, right? Behind the trachea, more into our neck, is the esophagus, all right? And so, bring in air through the nose or mouth, and then we go through the trachea, and now we have these two beautiful balloons that we call lungs, right? These lungs um, actually will fill up as this diaphragm, which is this um, muscular structure right underneath the lungs, expands, right? And I wish I had a little bit of a model to show you this, but um, we actually have what is called a negative pressure system, right? And so let me hop PowerPoints real quick, all right? And what a negative pressure system is, is essentially we create a vacuum inside of our bodies for a moment, right? And so um, this red curve, all right, is what we're looking at, all right? And uh, we're going to notice how it moves in the two different pictures, all right? And so on the left, we are breathing in. So we are taking air in through our face, all right, nose or mouth, and we are going to be um, expanding this uh, diaphragm down, right? And so what this creates is a uh, what's called a negative pressure system. And so as the diaphragm falls, it actually pulls the lungs to expand as well. And because the muscular walls of the lungs are expanding, they actually um, create a vacuum suction that takes in air through our nose or mouth. 
And so as we take a big deep breath in, most of our shoulders rise, but that's just because we do that without thinking. You should be just expanding your tummy, all right? For you vocalists who are in chorus or such, you know that stomach breathing is the proper way to breathe, right? And so you would expand out, diaphragm's all expanded, all right? Lungs are nice and full, and then when you wanna exhale, the diaphragm will retract, and it will close up those lungs again, and it's essentially just squeezing the water or air out of a balloon, all right? Um, in classroom, again, we would have a bit more of a demo of this, but um, it's actually pretty cool. But um, once you have air inside of your lungs due to the negative pressure system, we actually have these beautiful little um, branches inside of the lung called uh, brachials. Oh, sorry, that's your arm. <laughs> uh, bronchioles, and uh, on the end of those bronchioles, it looks like a set of grapes, um, they're called alveoli. All right, and so once uh, trachea splits, we have air in both lungs. We have these very uh, grapevine looking structures called um, bronchioles and alveoli. And on the alveoli, we have this very, very thin mem membrane with our circulatory system running through it, all right? And so if you remember when we went through the cardiovascular system, we had that um, pulmonary artery, all right? And that brought air um, with no, sorry, it brought blood with no oxygen to the lungs, right? And so that um, deoxygenated blood from those first two um, chambers of the heart are going to pump that blood to the ends of those alveoli at these capillaries. And there's such a thin membrane that the blood that's going to these capillaries on the tips of the alveoli are going to let all of the carbon dioxide, all of the CO2 out of that thin membrane, and simultaneously, simultaneously, it's a one-for-one one exchange. One CO2 pops out and O2 hops in, right? That's how hemoglobin works. And hemoglobin is what the, uh, the structure is on red blood cells that actually carry the oxygen, all right? And so once you have oxygenated blood, from those capillaries on the ends of our alveoli, all right? That blood goes back up to that pulmonary vein and then comes back to those last two chambers of the heart and that's now oxygenated blood and goes to the last two ventricles and then it will disperse into the aorta and then to the rest of the body, all right? Um, I'm sorry that most of these PowerPoints aren't really explaining what I am um, talking about, um, but um, again, I'm trying to make these um, not take as much time as they could, all right? And so the respiratory system and the digestive system are done, all right, and so let's go to the lymphatic system, all right, which is the immune system, all right. So our lymphatic system is our immune system, all right? Those two things can be synonymous, all right? And so we have these areas called lymph nodes, right? You have some under your neck, all right? If you ever go into the doctor's office and you're saying that you feel like you have a cold or something like that, a lot of the times they'll take two fingers and they'll massage right around your throat, right where your chin line pretty much sinks down to your neck, all right? You have two lymph nodes right here. Right, um, and what these uh, areas are, your lymph areas, um, it's essentially just a collection of uh, almost like a police department. You have all these officers who are your white blood cells, your T cells, your antibodies, and all of your defense uh, mechanisms, all right? They all pretty much hang out here until there's a response sent out in the body of that there's some foreign invader that your immune system or your lymphatic system needs to go take care of, right? And so when we get sick, um, there is chemical messengers sent throughout the body and it'll get picked up on and your lymphatic system will actually um, pretty much find the source of that uh, hormone signal and they'll go out and take care of the invader, right? This is not a fast process. I mean, it happens all in one day, but the actual fight of your your white blood cells versus the viruses or the cold that you have, that takes a while, right? 
And so the two main functions of the lymphatic system, this is a very simple PowerPoint, right? It drains the fluid back into the bloodstream, right? And so that fluid, your lymph fluid is not always in your bloodstream. It's there when it needs to be, right? And it does fight infection, right? It's made of proteins, fats, and lymphocytes. Um, the suffix ending C-Y-T-E-S, that's just a type of cell, lympho, immune cell, lymphocyte, all right? Um, and those uh, are two different types of cells, B cells and T cells. They're in that list earlier. Those B cells will turn to the cells that destroy or neutralize pathogens. And T cells, otherly known as killer T cells, help destroy abnormal cells and helper T cells uh, help the other T cells to control certain aspects of the immune system. And so we have natural killer cells and such that fight like things like cancer and all that such. Um, the immune system is a very intricate system because um, our bodies are constantly being berated with foreign invaders and it needs to be able to have something enter the body that's harmful but be able to take care of it. And if the lymphatic system is doing its job, we as the organism don't even notice that it's doing its job. All right. We notice when the lymphatic system isn't doing its job because that's when we get sick. All right. Um, these are just some uh, problems that can happen when your immune system is compromised. All right. We've been hearing that word for the COVID pandemic, immunocompromised. This is a problem with your lymphatic system. All right. So immune deficiency. All right. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but it essentially means that your body can't fight off diseases as well as a body that has a normal immune system. All right. Hodgkin's disease is camphor of the lymph tissue found in lymph nodes in the spleen. Hodgkin's disease is terrible because it essentially means that you don't have an immune system. All right. Tonsillitis. All right. Um, you'll hear that some people get their tonsils removed, which is in the very back of the throat. Um, it's an infection of the tonsils. All right. And so the lymphatic system, when it's doing its job, takes care of all of those foreign invaders that we breathe in when we constantly respire through our mouth and nose, that we take in, that's on top of our food, all right? Bacteria is everywhere, whether we like it or not, but most of it is taken care of by not only our stomach acid, but our uh, immune system as well. And um, the production of these types of cells, those white blood cells, T cells and such, most of that gets created in the bone marrow. So in that center, um, kind of spongy tissue in, inside of some of our bones. All right, and then um, our spleen and lymph nodes also will create a lot of these um, white blood cells, killer T cells. All right, and so very related to immune system, we're gonna segue away. We're going to the endocrine system, right? And this is essentially all of your, um, your hormones, right? And so, um, a minute ago, I said that during a attack by a pathogen or a disease, that there'd be a hormone response, all right? This is conducted through your endocrine system, all right? And so this diagram is pretty marked up, all right? And notice how many parts of the body actually um, contribute to the hormones going through your body, all right? And so just the major parts, pancreas, pituitary gland, thyroid, ovaries, testes, and many others, all right? Emphasis on the many others because um, many things actually produce these hormones, all right? And so a lot of the hormones actually are gonna be coming from your brain. And those of you who take uh, AP psychology, you will learn about these hormones in depth, all right? Things like serotonin, things like dopamine and such, all right? Um, different hormones will make us feel different things, all right? The pituitary gland, um, very integrated into um, the stages of puberty and such. Uh, I think we can <laughs> agree that puberty is a very hormonal moment, right? That's when the body goes through physical changes to become um, in, a, in, a, in a adult state, right? Um, their thyroid gland right here is also a big uh, produ producer of um, hormones and such. Your thyroid is going to be responsible for a lot of your um, disease control, actually. All right. And things like pancreas, adrenal glands, all right. The word adrenaline, all right. Think of your adrenal glands, all right. Those words sound uh, similar for a reason, all right. And, um, the male and female reproductive systems and such will produce different amounts of um, either testosterone for males or um, estrogen for females, right? And those are the pretty much uh, sex 
sex specific hormones, right? Um, the endocrine system doesn't have too much to say about it other than this is how the body communicates, right? If your brain needs to send a signal down to somewhere else in your body, it's going to do that through hormones, right? And a lot of these hormones are chemically charged and they're steroids, right? And so if any of you remember what type of molecule is the outer perimeter of our animal cells, right? It is the phospholipid bilayer. And um, our hormones are lipids, right? And so because of that, all of these hormones can freely travel from cell to cell without having to go through anything like receptor proteins or such. Hence why um, hormones and uh, things like a adrenaline shot, right? Um, if someone goes into cardiac arrest, they might get stabbed in the chest with a large needle that has epinephrine in it, which is adrenaline, right? And um, even though their heart is not beating, it just freely distributes through the through the sternal cavity. And um, it, a lot of the times that person will wake up and almost be like ready to run a marathon. It's, um, it is a very, very formidable system to manipulate, all right? So respiratory, digestive, endocrine, and lymphatic systems were the large ones to go over, all right? And so I do just want to um, touch upon a couple others, all right? And so you do have your integumentary system, all right? This is actually your largest organ. And what is it? It's your skin, all right? Tell me somewhere on your body that your skin doesn't touch other skin, all right? It's, it's nowhere, all right? Your skin is just one big protective layering over your entire body. Without your skin, all of our blood would leak out. Without our skin, all of those external pathogens, the bacteria that cover everything, would just be able to get into our body. All right. Our skin is essentially a battleground for us because if something harmful is on the outside of our body, it's our body's job to keep that harmful substance on the outside. Right. And so um, <clears throat> just to go through it very quickly. All right. You have this epidermis. Epi means top. All right. So your epidermis, your top skin. All right. There's five layers here. And these five layers are, are considered um, almost dead, all right? Your top three layers, as you touch your arm, the skin that you're actually touching is dead already, all right? It's the skin underneath that matters, all right? And so you'll see this labeled in this figure as derma, all right? The derma layer, all right, or dermal layer is this living tissue that continuously builds from the bottom up. All right, and so think about a time that you had some minor um, cut or scratch, all right, um, that uh, will scab over and then through time, it will just kind of grow out of your skin, all right? It, uh, your skin replenishes itself, again, from the bottom up, from that derma layer to the epidermis, all right? And so um, for those of you who discussed my, uh, the process of tattooing, all right. The, o the only reason why the ink stays in uh, someone who's got a tattoo's arm is because this ink is injected below the dermis or in the dermis. All right. If that ink only penetrated into the epidermis, all right, through just skin regeneration, that ink would push out of the skin. Right? So you got to get low enough. All right. And so your tegumentary system, it is your biggest system. All right. And um, unfortunately, <laughs> Um, there are some compromises to it, things like um, sweating, right? Sweating is a very healthy thing to do, all right? But it actually can clog our pores, to, uh, have things like acne occur and such. Um, hopefully, you can talk more about different types of glands, like your hair follicles and sebaceous glands, all right? This is where acne happens. This is where a clogged pore that, you know, will turn into something like a blemish, all right? Sorry about that, bird. They're very happy. But, um, all right, I have two more systems to touch upon, all right? The reproductive system, all right? So this is just essentially the um, the system that allows humans to re reproduce, all right? And so, um, vocab not being discussed, all right? The goal of this is to essentially be able to continue our species, all right? Um, in some happy way, the male gamete and the female gamete will meet up and um, it will 
fertilize and produce a offspring, right? If everything goes plan according to plan, right? There is a lot to be said about the reproductive system, but it's not my job to say it all. <laughs> so um, essentially just um, males are different than females when it comes to reproductive systems and we produce things differently. Um, but the big things for biology is to know the um, the gametes for each sex. So females produce eggs and males produce sperm. And um, as long as you know that process through meiosis and how a body cell will go through two sets of cell divisions and turn into a gamete, then you're okay for biology. All right, last but not least is the urinary system. And just like it sounds, the urinary system uh, produces urine. And I don't think I have a slide on it, all right? So I'm actually going to collapse this. All right, stop sharing my screen, all right? So in short, the urinary system is just how your body um, takes water out of things. So earlier I said that when we eat an apple, we take the, we take the water out of the apple. That's exactly what we do. Um, and that's um, satiated through the urinary system. And all that means is that once all that food has passed through the small and large intestine and such, that water and other waste products um, essentially go to your urinary bladder, which is right in your pelvis, right, right between your hips essentially. Um, and um, through gravity and a lot of muscle responses, um, that uh, fluid will exit the body, right? Um, and as of that, you pretty much got the entire body system into, uh, bodies, bodies systems in two videos, which is a very hard thing to, uh, do. So, um, I am going to end this video momentarily, but I just want to say, um, as long as you know the main function of each of the systems, you're in great shape, right? Um, with this whole addition of the... Um, not having to take the MCAS and such. It has um, made the understandings and learnings required by the students um, significantly um, less than what it should be. Um, but as long as you can pretty much say what the function of each system is, you're in great shape. All right, so this is our last video. So um, thank you so much for being such a respectful class and thanks for making my first year of teaching one to remember, all right? Um, I will be posting this week's assignment um, with this posting, and um, please do it. And if you have any makeup work, please finish that by that Wednesday of next week. And yeah, um, enjoy your summer, everybody. And um, thanks again. All right, peace out, everybody.